before we start today, a little bit of admin, uh, administrative, uh, some administrative messages. Uh, so first of all, the work groups. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback that the schedule for the work groups is very confusing, uh, for which I can only apologize. Basically, we had some schedule trouble and we had to switch the rooms around every week and it turned out to be very difficult to communicate to you um, which room you were in every week. What we did initially was we took we put these locations on the calendar belonging to the work group. So if you go into Canvas, most of you will know this already, but just in case, um, if you go to your work group, so I have to do that like this. Each work group has a home page. These home pages have a calendar. And on the calendar, you can see these events, and these events contain the location of the work group. If you're uh, enrolled in the work group, these events should be added to your main Canvas calendar, which you can add to your Google Calendar or any other calendar software. Uh, if you don't like that, and if that's uh, too complicated, you can also just go to the uh, syllabus. Yep. And under schedule details, you will just find a massive list of locations, which is a bit harder to decipher, but you can basically find where you need to be for your registered work group here. And again, I apologize for the inconvenience of this, uh, having it this messy, but this is the only way we could figure out how to communicate this to you. Uh, don't look at your VUNET schedule. I, I guess that's called VUNET for you, where you see your personal schedule from the VU you will see all locations for all work groups. So that's very uh, messy. We kind of screwed up your personal schedule. So don't look at that for this course. Uh, as for the project groups, most of you are now enrolled to a project group. Uh, about 100 of you are, in, uh, are not. Uh, those might be people who did the project last year or who decided not to take the course after all. If you do want to finish the course and you're not part of a project group yet, you have until Thursday, basically, to do so. Uh, if your project group starts with, uh, with a number lower than 30, you've already presented last week. If, you, if it starts with a number higher than 30, you are presenting this week on Thursday. And you don't want to join a group when the other members have already presented their work. Because then you have some catching up to do, you have to make up for something. Uh, so if you're still struggling, if you're still not sure who to find, just pick a group which still has spots left and join it. It may, may feel a little impolite, but that's fine, that's allowed, just join it and uh, get to know the people uh, in there. If you don't know how to get in touch with the people of the group you've joined, you can send an email to me or to one of the TAs and they will give you their email addresses. About these presentations on Thursday and on uh, last week. So last week was the second week, you weren't really uh, started yet and really started yet and you're still getting into this and, and getting used to the idea of machine learning. So a lot of the presentations, well, uh, not everybody presented and it was more of a sort of a group discussion about possible subjects. Um, starting this week, you really do have to present something. You have to go up front to the class uh, room and show what you did. It doesn't have to be a super formal presentation. It, you don't have to make lots of slides, but you have to show what you've been doing whether it's been something great and it's worked well, or it's terrible and nothing's worked, you have to show what you've been doing. And if you're still a little unsure about what you're going to be doing, what you're going to be working on, then what I recommend you do is use the worksheets. That's what they're for. So install the worksheets, click through them, see if everything works, and then don't say, okay, everything works and go and do something else look at the code and see if you can change something, right? Even if it's just one of the plots and you want to see if you can change the color, that's enough. Just see, well, can I change the color or can I change the label on the axis? And then go from there and start playing around with it and see how far you can go. 
There's five people of you to every group. If everybody does that for one hour, you will have enough to present. That's basically the idea. We just want you to explore uh, and investigate this stuff and show what you find. It doesn't have to be impressive. Uh, if you don't like the worksheets, if you can't get them installed, and you investigated some other program instead, like Beka, like RapidMiner, like SPSS, maybe even Excel, you can do machine learning in Excel, if you're so inclined, then tell us about that. Tell us where you found it, tell us how you installed it, tell us how it works. That's all we want you to do. Uh, we have some example projects from last year. Uh, we still have to ask the authors for permission, but once we get that, we'll put them on the blackboard. So keep an eye out for example uh, projects. The requirements are a little different this year, but basically they give you a good indication of roughly what we expect. But things like page length and stuff like that, number of references might be slightly different this year. And finally, uh, one third, the first third of the practice exam is now available. So I've decided instead of making the practice exam available all the way at the end, to uh, write one third after every two weeks of uh, lectures. So this is one third of the practice exam looking back at the last two weeks. Uh, that's on uh, Canvas. So have a look there. In the you can find it in the syllabus on the in the schedule. And you can have a look at the kind of questions you can expect and how much of this information you are expected to really retain for the um <coughs> for the exam. Uh, I think that's all the admin. So let's get started. With today's subject, which is probabilistic models. So we've put off talking about probability so far, but it's a very important topic in machine learning. So today we are going to dive into it. Something wrong with me. Um, and here's the plan for today. Let's write that down again. Uh, I noticed in the preliminaries that uh, out of the three preliminaries, linear algebra, calculus, and probability, probability was probably the most fuzzy for most people. So we're going to go through the basics just to uh, give you at least the, the keywords and the basic concepts of probability. Uh, if it's really, if you've really never done probability or if you've really done it a long time ago or if you didn't really get it the last time you did it, this might be too quick, but at least it'll give you something to hold on to and something you can uh, look up and look back later. Um, and we're gonna talk about classification using probabilistic models, specifically uh, Bayes classifiers. And that's enough for the first half. Uh, second half, I want to talk about something called information theory. Which is basically a very um, helpful way to think about probability. Uh, it's just a framework, a way to think about probability theory, and it comes back a lot in machine learning, and it's very helpful. It helps us uh, do a lot of useful things. Um, so I'm going to talk about the basic concept of uh, information theory, which are going to come back at different points during the course. We're going to make use of this a couple of times. One of those times is in defining uh, cross Entropy loss, which is an alternative to the least squares loss for classification that we talked about uh, last week, I think, uh, two weeks ago even. Um, and it's one of three, I think, yes, one of three loss functions for classification that we're going to talk about during the course. And this will, uh, this will also allow me to explain something called logistic regression, but we'll talk about that after the break. So, the basics of probability. Uh, let's start with the way we talk about probability in everyday speech, informally. Uh, so imagine you are a concerned parent 
who reads The Guardian and you read this article and you say to your partner, uh, have you read this? Wow. This means that our son, there's a 12.5% uh, probability that our son is gambling online. When we think he's asleep, he's gambling online. And your partner, who's more clear-headed, says, no, that's nonsense. First of all, we know our son, and the probability is much lower than 12.5% that he's gambling. And second of all, what do you mean probability? He either is gambling or is not gambling. There's no probability about it. It's something that's either true or not true. So in this conversation, your wife, uh, your partner, sorry, I made a note to make it gender neutral. Your partner is a, uh, uh, a subscriber to objective probability. The most uh, uh, well-known proponent of which is frequentism, which states that probability, when we say probability, what we mean is we are imagining a repeated experiment. And as we repeat that experiment uh, a number of times, the, rel the relative frequency that thing A happens over the total number of uh, experiments is the probability of thing A happening. So if I flip, if I say the, uh, I have a coin, probability that it lands heads is 0 0.5. What I mean is I could flip this coin a million times and it would land heads approximately 500,000 times. And as I, the number of flips goes to infinity, the proportion of times that it lands heads goes to 0 0.5. That's what, uh, that's what frequentism means, is that whenever you say probability, it's a shorthand for this kind of um, uh, thought experiment. So in that sense, your partner is right because you cannot do a repeated experiment on your son. You cannot say, we're gonna check a million times whether or not he's gambling because every time we would just find out whether or one or the other, but the repeats don't really enter into it. What you can repeat is you can sample a random teenage boy from the population and check if he's gambling. And then if you do that often enough, the relative proportion of boys gambling would converge to 12.5%. So you can talk about the probability that a randomly chosen teenage boy is gambling, but not the probability that your son is gambling. So you come back and you say, okay, whatever, but uh, maybe his friend Josh is gambling. So we know enough about our son to know that he's probably not gambling, but I don't really know much about his friends, so maybe one of his friends is gambling, because however you uh, interpret probability, these gambling teenage boys, they have to be hiding somewhere, right? And this kind of talking about probability, this kind of statement, is a subjective notion of probability, where instead of talking about these repeated experiments or talking about a proper, uh, as an objective property of the universe, as it were, you are talking about a property of yourself, your uncertainty. You are expressing your uncertainty. You are saying, I don't know something. So when you say probability, it's shorthand for saying, I don't know it, but these are the uh, certainties I assign to each outcome. So if I flip a coin, I don't know which side it's going to land on. And I am completely uncertain between the two halves, so I assign each uh, 50% probability. If I bend the coin over so that the uh, heads is on the bit that's uh, the, the bit that's bent, then the probability that it lands tails is much higher. So I assign a different probability that I know it's probably going to end tails, uh, land on tails, but it might land on heads. But it's all my belief. It's all my uh, uh, an expression of my belief, and. Obviously, uh, sometimes the two coincide. So in the coin case, I can express that as a repeated experiment or I can use it to state my beliefs, but the two coincide if my beliefs are correct. But in the case of our son gambling, the two don't coincide. And what I can say here under a, a subjective meaning of probability, I can say the probability that our son is gambling is not one in eight, because we know. We know a lot of stuff about our son, so we know that he goes to bed on time, we know that he doesn't have a secret credit card, so we can say 
the probability that our son is gambling is maybe 1%. But he has this friend, Josh, that we don't know anything about. So the only thing we can do is assume that he is like the rest of the teenage boys and apply only the knowledge that we have of teenage boys. And we can say the probability that Josh is gambling is 1 in 8. So that's the difference between how uh, these two, uh, well, between these two ways of interpreting probability. It's important to understand that the mathematics of probability, so the mathematical framework, the way it's defined, the structures, are the same. Regardless of how you apply it to reality, the way we define probability, probability theory, is always the same. So let's uh, run through that very quickly, through the basic definitions of probability. Uh, it always starts with the sample space. We do one of these experiments, or we are interested in expressing our uncertainty over a set of outcomes. And these outcomes are called the sample space. So if we flip a coin, then we have two outcomes, heads and tails. And the set of those two things is our sample space, omega. If we roll a die, we have six outcomes. If we roll two die, uh, dice, if we roll two dice, we have 36 outcomes expressed as these pairs. And uh, if we do something like measuring somebody's height, we might want to express the outcome as a real valued number. So a number somewhere between minus infinity and positive infinity, or between zero and positive infinity in this case. And in that case, we say that our sample space is the real number line, or the positive reals or something like that. The important distinction here is that this is a continuous sample space, and this is a discrete sample space. So here, for any two outcomes, there are infinitely many outcomes in between them. And here, there aren't. So between uh, one and two, there aren't any outcomes in between. It's a good question. So um, the question is, if we are, are modeling this as a, um, uh, if we're modeling the process of measuring somebody's height, should we not, is it not better to constrain the bound, to bound this space a little bit, to narrow the options a little bit, because you're not going to encounter anybody shorter than 50 centimeters, and you're not going to encounter anybody taller than three, three, uh, three meters. Um, so the first thing is, if you do that, let's say we have the real line and we say, well, anything that is reasonable and probable is going to be between 50, 50 centimeters and three meters. It doesn't really matter whether we cut off our sample space or not. We can also say that the real number line is still our sample space, but we just only assign a, a probability to this range. So your sample space can be a bit bigger than the things you assign probability to. Secondly, if, you, um, if the probability distribution that you want to put on top of this is something like a normal distribution, you can actually say in probabilistic terms that these things are extremely unlikely and that with 99.999% certainty your outcome will be in between these two things. Uh, but you can still leave a tiny little bit of probability for the uh, possibility that somebody is taller than three meters, which is usually, uh, well, it's a, it's a bit more safe than to constrain your options in, the, in this way. Either way, your sample space, even if you say I'm gonna limit it to this, your sample space is still continuous because between any two outcomes, no matter how close together they are, there is still an infinite number of outcomes in between them. Uh, I didn't draw it here, but you can also have an infinite discrete sample space. So if I say uh, my experiment is I flip a coin and I count the number of times I flip it until I see heads. So how many times can I flip tails in a row? Uh, the outcome of that is basically any natural number, right? Usually one, two, three, four, five are have the highest probability. 
But in theory, I could flip it 10 times in a row or 100 times in a row or 1,000 times in a row, I could flip tails. And that has some astronomically small probability. So the sample space there ranges from 1 to infinity. Uh, or from zero to infinity, so I could also flip tails, uh, flip heads immediately. Uh, and that's still a discrete sample space, because between one, between one and two, there are not an infinite number of outcomes. Um, so these are the basic things we assign probability to, or probability density in this case. Um, but we also want to talk about the um, probability of combinations of these things. We want to say, what's the probability that I will throw an even number with this die? Or what's the probability that somebody is between 50 centimeters and 3 meters tall? Uh, so you want to talk about combinations of outcomes. And these are called events. And the event space is the space of all possible events. So in the case of a die, we can just take the power set of the sample space, so the set of all possible subsets. And we can talk about things like, uh, what's the probability of the event that I throw a number higher than three? Uh, that's what you can do with uh, discrete, or at least with discrete finite dis uh, sample spaces. If you have a continuous sample space, you need to be a little bit more careful or it doesn't work out technically. So the technical term for that is uh, you have to take a sigma algebra the event space has to be a sigma algebra of your sample space. You don't need to worry about that. But uh, if you ever go into probability theory, that's, uh, that's what it's called. But the main takeaway is events are subsets of things in the sample space, uh, subsets of sample space. Then there's a the random variable. I'm always a little bit worried when I start talking about random variables because I want to give you the proper definition so you can really think about this these things properly, you can use these constructs as they were meant to be used. But the definition of a random variable is so unnatural and so, so convoluted uh, that it would take me at least the first half of this lecture to explain it and you would all be completely lost as to how it applies to the way things are actually used. So I'm not gonna give you the definition of the random variable, I'm just gonna tell you how we use it intuitively, which is also what Peter Flack does in the book. And basically, a random variable is a way to talk about events uh, in a more structured way. So we have a, a variable d here, which represents our experiment, represents our die, which we're throwing. And it takes one of these values. And it takes one of these values randomly. And then we can say, instead of what's the probability that we throw an even number, we can say, what's the probability that d is 4? What's the probability that d is bigger than 3? Or d is even? And stuff like that. So we simply use a, a random variable to express some, some outcome of our experiments. And in machine learning, we commonly use uh, random variables to represent our features. So let's say one of my features in a spam email is whether the word uh, meeting occurs. Then I model that as a random variable. I sample a random email. And this uh, random variable either takes the value true or false. Uh, the class, so whether the email is then spam or not spam, that's also a random variable, which takes the value spam or not spam. And then you can even model the parameters of your uh, model as a random variable, uh, which we'll see uh, in a bit. Uh, there's a lot of shorthand going on in um, probability theory, uh, because uh, writing things down the long way sort of it tends to complicate things. So it's important to understand how we abbreviate things and what that means. So here we see just basically the probability that a random variable takes a certain value. This, if you uh, evaluate this, what this represents is a single number, a single probability. Here we have a full statement of a statement of an event and a probability function, so this returns, as it were, a probability. But sometimes we want to talk about the probability that random variable x takes the value x, where x is another variable. Not a random variable, but a regular variable. So here we are essentially describing the whole 
probability distribution as a function of the value of random variable x. So this is, as it were, shorthand for what I've written here. So the probability that x is equal to x is one quarter if x is zero or three quarters if x is one. In this case, capital X takes two values. So this is shorthand for a probability distribution. This is shorthand for a single probability value. And then sometimes we just uh, take p of the probability, uh, p of the random value as a shorthand for the probability that the random value takes some, uh, some value. So this is shorthand for this. Uh, okay, let me run through the, um, some very simple, some very basic probabilities and concepts very quickly. Um, so let's say we have two random variables, x and y. We have the joint probability, which is simply the probability that x takes one value and y takes another value. Marginal probability, where we only care about one of them. A conditional probability, the probability of x given y. Uh, I'm a little bit sloppy with capital P's and non-capital P's. I meant to use non-capital P's everywhere, so there's no meaning in whether or not it's a capital P or not. Uh, that's just a mistake. So conditional probability, if we know y, what is the probability of x then? And then conditional independence and Bayes theorem, which I'll show later. Here's a running example. So these are our two uh, variables. We have some age. We pick a random person from our population. Uh, they can have an age, young, teen, or old, and they can have teeth that are healthy, unhealthy, or fake. And then the joint probability distribution, which is the distribution from which we can compute everything else, uh, would look like this. So for every possible combination of uh, values that the random variables can take, we get a probability. And the probabilities in this whole table, all nine probabilities, will sum to one. Now, if we take the marginal, if, we were e if we're only interested in one of these variables, like the probability that A is the age is old and we don't care about the state of the teeth, then we can just sum over the row of the table. This is why it's called a marginal probability, because you write it in the margins like this. So this is the probability that age is old, regardless of the probability of teeth. Uh, this is just how you write that down. The conditional probability, the probability if we know that the age is young, what's the probability of somebody having false teeth, a young person having false teeth? That's basically the probability if we know that we're in this row, what's the probability of that we're in this cell? So if we throw a dart and the dart lands in this area, proportional to all the probabilities. If we know that the dart has landed in this row, what's the probability that it's landed in the middle square of the row? Which is just we take this probability and we divide it by the sum of the row, which is the joint probability of f and y divided by the marginal probability of py, which is 3 over 9 in this case. Uh, if you do this, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, the, these are not uh, properly. Uh, yeah, that's a mistake. This should be uh, this should be U, or this should be F. So what we've done here is for this cell. So it's not three over nine; it's one over nine. Yeah, that's a mistake. So if we do this for a continuous distribution, then it looks like this. This is our joint probability distribution. We have X here and Y here and we get this kind of multivariate normal distribution that we've already seen. If, we've ma if we marginalize it, we essentially sum in this direction or in this direction, we get values like this. And if we take the uh, conditional probability, that's basically saying what if I know that y has value zero, and we draw a line here, and we intersect the multivariate normal distribution along this line. And then in all cases, because of the way normal distributions work, uh, both on the margins and on the conditional, we get another uh, normal distribution. Independence, two uh, probabilities, two random variables are independent 
if their joint distribution is just the product of their marginal distributions. In other words, that means that if I know y, it doesn't tell me anything about x. So x conditional on y is the same as just the probability of x. And we can do that uh, with the conditional as well. That's called conditional independence. So x and y are conditionally independent given z. If they might be, they are dependent, they might be dependent. But once I know the value of z, then their joint probability splits apart like this. So if I know the value of z, then knowing y doesn't tell me anything extra about x. Um, don't have time to go into that, but if this is if you find this confusing, please have another look at the first week's homework exercise where this is explained as well. Then Bayes rule, probably the most important formula in our field, it's our equal, uh, e equals mc squared, uh, and it's basically a solution to the inversion problem. Basically, what uh, what Bayes, Thomas Bayes, studied and many others studied in his time was the problem of uh, having some observed val uh, some observable we have observed so oh, sorry we've observed something and we have a model of the world so we know how certain causes cause certain observables to happen so it's very easy if we assume some cause to compute the probability of something happening so if i have an unfair coin i can compute the probability of it landing heads and tails but what you're usually interested in is something you've observed uh, mapping something you, you've observed back to the causes. So if I've observed a sequence of heads and tails from a coin, I would like to get a, a sense of the probability of how unfair the coin is, rather than the other way around. Uh, so we have a probability distribution in one direction, but we want it in the other direction, a conditional. How do we do that? Well, that's base, and it looks like this. Uh, and we're going to come back to this a couple of times. So usually in learning what you do, if you have some sort you assume you have some sort of machine which is defined by a parameter theta, and the machine produces your data, so that you observe the data, but you don't know how the machine is configured. And the machine can be the world, or it can be a computer, or it can be anything. But theta, your parameter, uh, expresses how it's configured. So if you know how the machine is configured, you can derive a probability distribution over the data very easily. But usually what you see is the data and you want to know how the machine is configured. So does the inversion problem apply to machine learning? Uh, so you can do this with Bayes, of course, but uh, the frequentists also have an answer to this. What they do or what they say, what they use as a, a, a criterion, is they say the theta that you should choose, that you should assume, given the data, that uh, uh, the configuration of the machine that you should assume is basically the one that maximizes this quantity. So this is not inverted. This is the probability of uh, the data given the, uh, the parameter, the, the configuration of the machine. So you just choose the configuration of the machine that under which the data is most likely. We call that maximum likelihood estimation. And the function, this function, this conditional expressed as a function of theta is called the likelihood. So if a frequentist were to fit a normal distribution, we would see some data x, we assume that it's drawn from a normal distribution with a mean and a standard deviation. Um, we would simply say the best mean and standard deviation that you can pick according to this max maximum likelihood criterion are the ones that maximize the probability of seeing this data. Which is just, you split, you assume the data is independent and you multiply the uh, probability densities of all the values under this particular normal distribution. And you maximize this value to get your ideal mean and standard deviation. Which may sound a bit confusing, but basically this is, if you compute a mean and a standard deviation for your data, this is basically the values you're computing. Except that this is the uh, unbiased estimate for the standard deviation. So you're not 
dividing by n minus 1, you're dividing by n as you're uh, doing. But apart from that, this is basically what you're doing when you're fitting a normal distribution. Uh, that's not what Bayesians do. So here we see the, the practical difference between Bayesian learning and frequentist learning. Bayesians say, I'm not interested in a single value. Don't give me a point estimate of the parameters. Give me a probability distribution over the parameters. I've seen the data, so I'm uncertain. I don't know, I don't know what the uh, configuration of the machine was. I don't know the state of the uh, parameter that generated the data. So I'm uncertain about it, so express that uncertainty in this probability distribution. The probability over the parameters given the data, which you can then turn around using Bayes. So our model tells us the probability of the data given the uh, parameters. We multiply that by what we call the prior, our prior belief over the parameters, and we divide by uh, Px. This is division is usually not necessary. You can usually get rid of that in some way. So we call this the posterior, and we call this the prior. Basically, this is your belief of the state of the parameters before you saw the data, and this is how you update that belief after you've seen the data. Uh, this you can compute. This you have to choose. Bayesians tell you nothing about what your prior belief should be. So your prior belief that some email is a spam before you've seen the email depends on your beliefs about the world. But once you've chosen your prior and you've seen the email, you can compute your posterior. And this is kind of a, a little bit of a weak spot because usually these priors are chosen to make the math mathematics uh, easier rather than as a true expression of your uh, beliefs. So this is what it looks like when a Bayesian fits a distribution. You assume a normal distribution, you see some data, you assume a normal distribution, you do a bunch of mathematics, and then you get a probability distribution over the mean, mu. Uh, this is sort of uh, halfway between the two. So you're still, if you still take a point estimate, but you do want to take into account the prior probability of certain models, of certain parameters, then you can multiply that in, multiply the likelihood by the prior, and that's called the maximum a posteriori model which is sort of, Bayesians say this is not properly Bayesian because it's a point estimate, and frequentists say this is not properly frequentist because you're expressing belief about the parameters, because you're expressing a probability distribution over the parameters, and the parameters don't have probability, they have a fixed value. So both camps sort of disown this, um, this approach, but it's very, very useful, and it's usually uh, a little bit better than the uh, maximum likelihood uh, approach. And that's sort of the way we do things in machine learning. We don't really care about these two camps because we have our own notion of, of correctness, which is performance on the test set. That's what we care about. We don't care about whether our probabilities are true, whether they reflect the real world. We just want good performance. So we tend in machine learning to use these probabilities just as Lego blocks. And if we put them together and we make something that works, then fine. We don't care whether it's true or not. Uh, so we tend to mix and match approaches from Bayesian and frequentist statistics, but it's still it's useful to know the, the distinction. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is something slightly different than this kind of model of fitting parameters. We're going to talk about classification for the rest of the lecture. Uh, and classification in probabilistic terms look like this. We have some random variable for each feature. So for feature one, we have random variable x1, which might be discrete for a categorical feature and uh, continuous for a numeric feature. And then we have a random variable for the class, which for this uh, sake of an example, we'll take as ham and spam. And then we simply express, so here x is a row of uh, random variables, uh, a set of random variables for each feature that we have. And given x, we want to know the probability of spam and the probability of ham. And that's a probabilistic classifier. So it's one where instead of, uh, it's a little machine where instead of giving it an instance and getting a probability, oh uh, sorry, instead of giving it an instance 
and getting a class back. We give it an instance and we get a distribution over the classes. And if we want the former, we can just pick the class with the highest probability. But we can also use these probabilities to rank the instances as we did in uh, uh, the lecture last week on Monday. So a probabilistic classifier is automatically a ranking classifier. So we can compute this ROC curve. Uh, and we can get a sense of how certain the classifier is. That's also very useful. So here, this classifier is pretty certain. Whereas if this was uh, 0.45 and this was 0.55, it would be a lot less certain. And we can use that downstream. We can use that to judge whether or not we should actually delete this email or ask the user whether or not it's a uh, spam uh, email or not. So these things are very useful. There are two approaches. The discriminative approach, which is to say we're doing machine learning and we have a function. So we're just going to try and learn this function. We are going to do a kind of regression where we try and simply map the uh, feature vector to the probability of spam. That's called the discriminative approach because you learn to discriminate between x's of one class and x's of the other class. Talk about that after the break. There's also the generative approach where you say we're interested in this, but by Bayes' law, Bayes' rule, this is proportional to the probability of x given the, uh, given the class label times the probability of the class. And the probability of the class is usually easy to estimate. Usually you can just take the relative frequency in your training set to get the probability of ham versus the probability of spam. But this value is what we're interested in. This is what we're going to spend our energy modeling. We are going to fit a generative probability distribution to the spam class and to the ham class. And then we're going to see which one gives us the highest probability. And it's called generative because if you have this probability distribution, then you can basically sample from it. So you can sample spam emails and ham emails from this probability distribution. That's why it's called generative. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, probably save a little bit for after the break as well. Um, but just to give you the basic setup, we choose some probability distribution M, like a multivariate normal. We split our data set into the positive points and the negative points, so spam and ham. We fit one model to the positive points, one model to the negative points, which gives us a probability distribution over x given positive and x given negative. And then for a new point x, the way we classify it, the way we generate probabilities, uh, well, let's say, First, we want to just classify it. We don't care about the probabilities. We just argmax over the classes, so over positive and negative. We compare the probability uh, of seeing this point generated by the probability distribution for positive times the prior probability of positive. We compare that value to the probability of seeing this point generated by m negative times the prior probability of, m, uh, of negative points. We check which one is higher, and that's the class we assign to the point. Or if we want probabilities, then we compute both values and we normalize so that they sum to one. So then we get probability distribution over the classes. Uh, so if we do that with uh, multivariate normal distributions, here we have one class, one other class, we fit a normal distribution to one and we fit a normal distribution to the other. And we check for each point which assigns the higher probability and assign that class. Then we get a decision boundary that looks like this. So that's a basic Bayesian classifier. So I'm running a little behind. Uh, I recommend we take a break, you digest this. And after the break, we uh, will talk about naive base classification, which is a simplification of this. And then we'll quickly go into information theory and cross entropy loss. All right. Uh, let's get started again. So this is where we left off. The basic idea of a Bayesian classifier. <coughs> 
We have two classes, spam and not spam. We fit to both of them a multivariate, well, in this case, a multivariate normal probability distribution. And then if we get a new point, a new uh, email, for instance, we simply see where the point falls in the feature space, let's say here, and then we uh, compute the probability density under both models. And if this is higher than this, then we assign the point the class uh, black, let's say spam. And in this case, the decision boundary looks like this, becomes a, a, hyper, a hyperbola. Um, so that works okay if you have uh, a small number of features. If you have a large number of features, uh, these kinds of methods get uh, tricky because you need a lot of data. So let's say if we move to a discrete space, so let's say each feature is whether or not a certain word occurs. Let's say we want the word uh, meeting and the word bill, and we do this for 10,000 words. And we check for each email, does the word occur in the email or not? And we get a big table of binary features. Uh, if you want to model all the dependencies between each of these 1,000 uh, or 10,000 words, you need a lot of data. Uh, and usually, even in this day and age, we don't really have enough email data to model all the dependencies between every two, uh, between every pair of possible words. So that's where naive Bayes comes in. And naive Bayes is basically the idea of we, uh, the idea there is that we take a Bayesian classifier, but we make a very naive assumption, an assumption that is almost always incorrect. Namely, we assume that the features, all features, are independent conditional on the class. So if I know this is spam, and the probability that I will see the word congratulations and the probability that I will see the word hello are completely independent of each other. Which is not true, of course. If you say this is a phrase like meeting place, these words occur together a lot. So the word meeting and the word place, they have very high dependence, whether it's spam or not spam. But we simply assume anyway that they are all independent. So we have a very naive and a very incorrect model of emails but a model that allows us to simplify things a lot. So here's a, a data set to illustrate. So we have, we move away now from uh, numeric features and we move to discrete features. And we have these two words, we'll stay in 2D for now. We have the word pill and the word meeting. And for each email, each row is an email and for each email we mark it with true if the word occurs in the email, and we mark it with false if the word doesn't occur in the email. So what the naive base classifier does is to each of these features we can fit a distribution, um, which in this case is just a, uh, well, technically it's a Bernoulli distribution, but what I'm doing is I'm just uh, counting the relative frequencies. And what you end up with is it's conditional on the class, so we filter by class first. We say the, cla the probability of seeing the first word in an email given that it's ham is two out of six. This is how we estimate the probability because two of the emails we've seen had this word out of six of the spam emails that we have in total in our uh, data set. And the probability of seeing false is four over six because four of the ham emails that we saw in the data set have this uh, have this feature. And we do the same thing for spam. So we filter out all the spam emails and we test them and we see, well, there are five of them and three, of three out of five have the word pill have this feature. So the probability of that happening given that it's spam is three over five and the probability of not happening is two over five given that it's a spam email. And we estimate all of these probabilities and then we can just build those under this naive base assumption, we can build those into a classifier. So the probability of uh, seeing some, uh, some class Y, given all the features, we turn that around, is proportional to all of these features given that the class is Y times the probability that the class is Y. And then we just break this apart using the naive base assumption into a load of independent features. 
uh, which works very well, and it's uh, it's a little simplified, but it's how basically the very first successful spam classifiers worked. Uh, we'll look into some of the more... Um, uh, there's a slightly better way to do it if you know that you're dealing with text, if you know that your data is sequential. It's a slightly different way of doing this. We'll look into that in a later lecture, but the basic principle behind Naive Bayes is this. Uh, it works very well, but it has one problem, which is that sometimes one of the features in your data set uh, uh, for one value uh, of the feature doesn't occur at all. In this case, if it's spam, then in all of the examples of our data set, all, uh, the first feature is always true. So the prob our estimated probability here is one, that it's true, and our estimated probability that it's false is zero. Um, which is kind of going to screw with our mathematics if you look at the uh, definition here again. So we split it after we split it up into a product of independent features. If one of these is going to be zero, because this is a big product, then immediately the whole thing becomes zero. So if we're interested in, uh, if we ch check all the features and we get this effect for one of the features, then it doesn't matter if for all of the other features the probability of uh, the feature given spam is super high because we've seen one zero and everything collapses. So we want to be a little bit more robust against this because especially if we have 10,000 features, this is quite likely to happen. The simplest way to do that is to uh, add what we call pseudo. Whoa. Sorry, I think I need a new clicker. Yes, this is where we were. So we have one feature that turns to zero, so the whole uh, probability turns to zero, even if all these other features are really high. But that's not what we want. So what we can do is we can add pseudo observations. So what I've done here is I've added, for each uh, value that the feature can take, I've added one observation uh, where all features take that value. So we add one observation where all features are false, and we add one observation where all features are true. And then our estimate, so this is our unsmoothed estimate of the probability, the frequency of t in the spam data divided by the total number of spam instances, and after smoothing it becomes this. So we add one to the frequency of, uh, always to the frequency of spam data, and we add we do that for all the classes, so the uh, denominator also needs to be raised by the number of classes so that the probability works out. And then even if we haven't actually seen this happening in our data, we still get one over this value for uh, low probability events, so it never becomes zero. It becomes very low, but it never becomes zero. That's what we're after. Uh, so just uh, recapping very quickly, we've, so we've seen uh, Bayesian and frequentist methods of learning, but we've noted that in machine learning we tend to just use what works. Uh, we've discussed the difference between discriminative and generative learning. So discriminative modeling learns the uh, distribution, uh, the class distribution given the data directly. Generative modeling learns the distribution of the data given the class and the class prior and uses this to construct the probability of the class given the data. Examples of this were the Bayesian classifier and applying a independent assumption, the naive Bayesian classifier or naive Bayes classifier. Um, and then if you have, uh, uh, if your estimates from the data lead to zeros in your naive Bayes classifier, you can solve that with Laplace smoothing, which is basically uh, equivalent to adding pseudo observation to your data. You don't have to actually add these to your data, you can just compute it slightly differently, but it's conceptually you're adding things to your data. Uh, this is where the break was supposed to be. So that's naive base dealt with. So now we go into information theory.
And just to set the scene, imagine you are on a trip, maybe on a boat or on a train somewhere, and you want to play a game with your family or your friends, and you've brought your travel Monopoly kit. So you're going to play Monopoly. But as always happens, especially with travel uh, editions of games, the dice are missing. Somebody lost them somewhere. So you don't have any dice, but you do have a coin. The question is, can you use coin flips in some way, in some mechanism, to simulate the action of the dice? So the dice give you uh, two probability distributions, two uniform distributions over six, uh, over numbers from one to six. Can we get that out of a die, uh, out of a coin? If we flip the coin multiple times, can we somehow get a probability distribution that gives us this? Well, let's make it easier first. Let's assume that we have a four-sided die. The um, Dungeons and Dragons players among you may be familiar with this type of thing. Uh, so we have a die with four sides with an equal probability for each side. And this is easy to model with two coin flips, right? You flip the coin twice. If it lands tails, tails, you go, uh, you assign it one. If it's tails, heads, you assign it two. If it's heads, tails, you assign it three. And if it's heads, heads, you assign it four. And each of these have equal probability. So you get, with two coin flips, you can play uh, a game that requires a four-sided coin. If you want to do this for a uh, six-sided die, things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, so I've uh, drawn it here for a three-sided die, which doesn't exist, but if you can um, simulate a fair probability distribution over three outcomes, you can also do six outcomes, right? Because you can just put a coin flip before it. So how do we do a uniform distribution over three outcomes? Basically, we do the same thing again. Uh, so tails or heads, this should be a straight line. Tails or heads, tails or heads, we flip twice. And the first three we assign to the three outcomes. And the fourth, if uh, the fourth happens, if we uh, have two heads, then we simply reject the sample and we try again. Basically what you get is an infinite tree where if you end up here, you do the same thing again, and if you end up here, you do the same thing again. You get this infinite tree. Uh, so if you're unlucky, you might end up flipping the coin quite a lot of times, but uh, the probability that you have to keep flipping diminishes exponentially, and the resulting probability distribution is uh, a uniform distribution over three outcomes. For our purposes, however, this is not what we want. We want to look at trees where there is just one outcome per leaf of the tree. So we want trees like this, where only, where every outcome occurs only once. So we, ca we just accept that we cannot simulate a fair die and we cannot simulate uh, die that, uh, uh, dice that don't have powers of two. Uh, and we just ask what probability distributions can we simulate? And our options are quite varied. We have quite a lot of things we can do. For instance, we can simulate, we are allowed to go infinitely far, so we can simulate an exponential, exponentially decreasing distribution on the natural numbers, like this. So we just flip a coin and we assign it one, two, or three, depending on how many times we uh, flip heads before we see tails. Or if we want a distribution that decays more uh, sort of polynomially, we can draw a tree like this and put more outcomes on the same, uh, same level. And then we see that the distribution decays much slower. So we have quite a lot of options in designing these trees. Uh, in this designing this tree, we can uh, simulate by coin flips quite a lot of different probability distributions over a set of outcomes. Uh, there's a name for this, it's called a prefix tree. Prefix, sorry, it's called a prefix-free code. Uh, it's sort of confusingly called a prefix tree, but it means a prefix-free tree, because it gives you a prefix-free code. The reason it's called a prefix-free code, because we can interpret these as code words. So instead of heads, we say zero, instead of tails, we say one. So now we have a code word for every leaf in the tree. So this has a code word zero, zero. C has a code word zero, one, one. And because we've arranged them in a tree like this, we know that no code word in the set of code words for these things has the same prefix as any other code word. Why do we care? 
is if we stick them together like this. So we use these codes to encode a sequence of outcomes. We can read it from left to right, and we don't need any delimiter characters. So if we read this from left to right, we go 0, 0, A. So we color this A. We go back to the top of the tree. We go 1, 0. So we color this orange. We go 0, 1, uh, 0. So we B. So we read this as a B. And you can read the whole sequence uh, from left to right. You can decode it as a sequence of uh, characters. So that's why we call the prefix tree, prefix tree uh, code, which is useful. But the reason it's useful in the context of probability um, distributions is that, the, that if you have a prefix free code, so you can represent it as a tree, then you also get a probability distribution. Basically, by coin flipping, you can sample from, this, uh, from the outcomes of this, from the leaves of this tree. And the probability of seeing a certain outcome is just one half times one half times one half until you reach the outcome. So the probability of C is one half times one half times one half is one in eight. In other words, it's one half to the power of the length of the code to the one half to the power of the length of the path from the root to the leaf, which you can rewrite as two to the power of minus the length of the code. So the probability distribution that this tree describes is two to the power of minus the length of x, where L is the length of the code word. And we can turn this around. So if I give you, let's say, um, I say I have a prefix tree. I'm not telling you what it is. But I give you the probabilities for all the outcomes. Then you know that the length of my code words, is, uh, the length of the code words is minus the binary logarithm of px. That's just this, but inverted. You just take the exponentiation and you take it to the other side. So now we can talk about what kind of probability distributions we can uh, represent as prefix-free trees. Because there's an algorithm called ar arithmetic coding, which given any probability distribution, so we start with the probability distribution and we design a tree that is as close to it as possible. For any probability distribution, we can design a prefix-free code such that the difference between the code words from the code and min log px is never more than one bit. So like I said, we can't properly um, express every probability distribution as one of these trees if we want the, the nodes to be uniquely labeled, but we can get to within a distance of one bit. So if we are willing to ignore that minor difference, because one bit is usually, usually we have very many outcomes with very small probabilities with very high code lengths. Maybe I should emphasize this. So if you do this trick, a code with short code lengths corresponds to a probability distribution with high probability. So if you assign X a short code, it gets a high probability. If you assign it a long code, it gets a low probability. And usually the probability distributions that we're interested in have relatively high, have all have relatively high code length, lengths, relatively low probabilities. So one bit is not very much. So we can just ignore this, or we can say, uh, suspend our disbelief and say that the codes can take non-integer values. So we have a code length of 1.1 bits or something. And if we do this, then we can equate codes with probability distributions. So we can say, I have a, if I have a probability distribution, then I also have a code. And if I have a code, then I also have a probability distribution. Uh, I'm going to skip the minimum description length principle. You can read about it in the book. It's very uh, useful. But the main reason I brought this up, the main reason I'm talking about this, is to um, explain and discuss the concept of entropy. So let's say we sample some data from a data source P. Then we know that the code corresponding to data source P gives us code words of length min log Px. So my question to you now, 
uh, no uh, looking ahead in the slides. Can you now write down for yourself the expected code length under X? And I won't ask you to, but I want you to take a few minutes just to see if you can do this. If you understand this well enough to do this, and just uh, briefly to talk about expectations, let's say I am going to give you some money, and with probability one quarter, I'm going to give you 10 bucks, and with probability three quarters, I'm going to give you one buck, then the expected amount of money you get is one quarter times 10 plus three, quarter, uh, three quarters times one. So instead of uh, money, think code length. Instead of probability, uh, or the end of probability corresponds to the source of your data. So can you now write down the expected code length? I won't ask you to say it out loud, but anybody who thinks they have it roughly, thinks they can more or less get there. Anybody who says no, never mind, move on. I'll assume you want a little bit more time then. Yeah, I'm ready to move on. So here it is. It's very simple. Basically, you uh, sum over all the possible outcomes. You take the code length from each, which is the mean log of the code length. I'm assuming all the logarithms are binary logarithms, so I'm dropping the, the base two. Uh, since I'm summing over all of them, the minus falls out of the summation. I multiply each by their probability, and then I sum it. And that is, if I have a perfect code that perfectly corresponds to my data distribution, this is the expected code length that I need for a, an outcome randomly sampled from P. And that's what we call the entropy. And the nice thing about the entropy is that it expresses how uniform our data is. It's a very good expression of the uncertainty we have over the outcome. So here we have a perfectly uniform distribution, four outcomes, each probability one four, one fourth. And the entropy is exactly two bits. Because you need two bits to describe each one of these, and they're all equal, so neither of them has a higher, uh, higher code worth than any other. But if the distribution is skewed, so if A is much more likely than B, which is even more likely than C and D, then the uh, entropy drops. The entropy goes down because we know something. We know that A is more likely, so we can assign A a short code word. So in this case, A gets a code word of one bit, B gets a code word of uh, two bits, and C and D get code words of three bits. And then our expected uh, uh, code length drops, which means because we have lower entropy, we have a less uniform and a more uh, varied distribution. We have more knowledge about our outcomes. And that's very useful in uh, dealing with uh, various things in machine learning. We also have cross entropy, which is uh, uh, what we use in the case where the source of our, uh, our data is not exactly the same as the distribution or the code that we use to encode it. So we have P is the source of our data, but we're going to use the code corresponding to Q, our model, to encode the data. And then our expected code length is this. So we still average over P because that's where the data comes from, but all our code words are produced by Q, so we put log Q here. Uh, and this gives us an indication of the difference between P and Q. So if P and Q are equal, then this is equal to the entropy, and our expected code length is equal to the uh, 
uh, to the entropy. And if not, then it's bigger. The closer Q gets to P, the closer this gets to the entropy. And if we want this to be uh, zero instead of uh, the entropy, so we want a value that is zero if P and Q are the same and gets higher the more different P and Q are, we can use the Kullback, li Kullback, sorry, the Kullback Leibler divergence, which is simply the difference in code length between, uh, the expected difference in code length between P and Q or the difference in expected code length. So slightly different things, but they turn out to, uh, the in value they're the same. Basically this is the expected code length using our suboptimal model Q minus the expected code length using the optimal model P. And this is how much we waste by using Q instead of P. The expected waste in bits by using Q instead of P. And if you write all of this out, you can rewrite it to this form, which is used most often. So summary of information theory, it gives us two measures. It gives us the entropy and the cross entropy. The entropy is a good measure of the uniformity of P. The cross entropy and the related kullback leibler divergence are good measures of the distance between a model and another model, often the model and the truth. So that's all I'll tell you about information theory. That's gonna come back a couple of times. So uh, if you didn't quite get that, please have another look at the video and another look at the slides. And if you still don't get it, please ask a question on the discussion board. Finally, let's look at discriminative classifiers, as I promised. So discriminative classifiers are functions that learn the relationship between the class probability and the um, data directly. And they're called discriminative because we don't learn anything about the distribution of x. We don't care about the distribution of x, we only care about the relation between x and y. So they can discriminate between the classes but they don't know anything about the uh, distribution over x. And in order to uh, learn discriminative models, it helps to have a good loss function for discriminative models. So basically, if we have a probabilistic classifier, Q, and uh, let's say we're doing ham spam detection again, so uh, I've put the conditional in the subscri subscript here to uh, uh, keep the notation a little bit more manageable. So this is under our model, the probability of spam given X and the probability of ham given X. And we have some model and it just says, might not be true, uh, might be a good model, might be a bad model, but it says, I think the probability of spam given X is 0 0.1 and probability of ham is 0 0.9 because they have to sum to one. And P in this case is the data label. So we assume instead of um, interpreting the data as something that gives us a fixed label, we interpret the data as something that gives us a probability distribution, but a probability distribution that always assigns probability one or zero. So here it assigns probability one to the class uh, spam, to the class spam, and zero to the class ham. So our model is not very good. The model gets it very wrong. And then we can just compute the cross entropy between P and Q, between the data labels and between Q. And we can use that as a loss function. The lower that is over all of our data, summed over all of our data, the lower this cross entropy is, the better we're doing. Uh, what are we looking at? Oh yeah, um, so we can write that down, the loss function over the whole data set, we can write it down like this. So it's the sum, uh, let me say this properly, yeah. So we start with this over all of our data. Um, let me do this on the blackboard to make it more clear. So if you write out the cross entropy for one of these things, you get this P X log Q X for some class. 
uh, for that class p is either one or zero. So depending on whether the uh, class is correct or not, p says probability zero or one, uh, the whole term in this sum, this cross entropy sum, either is either log of qx or it disappears. So if this is zero, it disappears. If they and if they coincide, uh, we ju we're just left with this. So if we r we write out the cross entropy loss, we can rewrite it to this, which is just for all the positive points in our data. We sum up log binary logarithm of qx of positive. So for all the um, positive points, we want the distribution of uh, the, the, the probability, the logarithm of the probability assigned by our model that is positive. And for all the negative points, we want the probability that our model assigns it negative. So this is what the cross entropy loss reduces to because P is always zero or one. Why do we uh, want this? Why is this helpful? Well, if you remember in the first week, uh, lecture two, we discussed what happened if you use accuracy in a classification task, if you use accuracy as a loss function. We're interested in maximizing accuracy and minimizing error, so you use error as a loss function. Uh, but what you get if you use error as a loss function is this kind of loss surface, where you get basically big areas where the loss is exactly the same, and then sudden jumps, because you have this decision plane and if you wiggle it around, if you move it around a little bit, you change the parameters slightly, then either your classifications of the data set stay the same, if it doesn't skip over a point, or if it skips over a point, then it changes radically from one value to another. So if the decision plane moves over a point, we see this, and if it stays between the same points, we uh, get this, which means that our gradient is either always zero or if we're exactly on this line, it's infinite. N and neither are very helpful values. So we can't do gradient descent on a surface like this. We need to smooth the surface. We need to somehow give a linear classifier a loss function that gives us uh, a changing smooth surface. Uh, what we used the last time was the linear, uh, there was the least cl squares classifier. So basically what we said here, we essentially define our decision plane as uh, saying if it's um, we are the are, sorry our classifier is a function like this if that function is higher than one we assign it one class and if it's lower than one we assign it the other class that's how we dis define the classifier so why don't we just assign all the points in the data set some some value higher than what zero and some th all the other points in the data set some value lower than zero and then just fit this line using li uh, least squares. <laughs> um, and essentially what we're doing now, what we're going to do now to build a, li uh, a discriminative classifier is we're going to assign all of the blue points probability one. So basically this value is now the probability of the point being blue and these have probability zero that they're blue, these have probability one that they're blue, and our model is now a line through this space. It's not a straight line, because probabilities are between zero and one. So what we want is this uh, plane, which is always gives us an output between minus infinity and positive infinity. We want to squeeze that range into the range between zero and one. We want to take this, output here and we want to squeeze it into the values between 0 and 1. And for that we're going to use the logistic sigmoid, which is this function. It looks a little bit uh, intimidating maybe, but it's a very useful function. It's usually defined like this. And the main thing to realize is that basically it takes the range, the output of our uh, linear function, the uh, interval between negative infinity and positive infinity. That's its input and the output is always between zero and one. So it gives us probabilities, or it gives us things that we can interpret as probabilities. You can also define it like this, and it has this nice property of symmetry. 
So uh, one minus the sigmoid. So let's say this distance is the same as this distance. Essentially, if you flip it around, uh, rotate it around this point 180 degrees, it fits exactly on top of itself and the sum of the two functions is one. The empty space here is also a sigmoid curve. So these are useful properties for later. For now, we're going to use this to define uh, uh, a discriminative model. So we take our linear model here, uh, but we put the output in a sigmoid, and then we get a line like this to our points. And we can interpret this line as the probability that this point is blue. And now all we have to do is take this model, this classifier, and fit it to our data. That's called logistic regression. So we use the sigmoid function to turn a linear classifier into a discriminative probabilistic classifier. So we get, for any particular model, for any particular value of W, uh, of w and B, we get some class probabilities. They might be very good or they might make no sense at all. So we are going to look for good values of W and B. And we're going to do that using cross-entropy loss. So we derive the gradient, and then we search. Uh, and if we have derived the gradient, unlike least squares, there is no analytical solution, but it is a convex problem. And if we get it right, it looks something like this. So here we have a feature space with some blue points and some red points. And it assigns this region of feature space a very high blue probability, and this a very high red probability. And as we get towards the decision boundary, the probabilities get less and less and more mixed until on the decision boundary, we see a probability of exactly 50-50. So let's uh, derive the, the uh, gradient. Um, and main, well, let's go through it first uh, and just uh, see how much of this you uh, uh, can uh, absorb. Don't worry if all of it seems, if it's a bit much to, to absorb all of it, just see how much of it you can uh, keep up with, as it were. So this is our loss function, as I showed you earlier. And we're going to take the derivative with respect to one of the elements of this uh, vector w, one of our parameters, wi. There should be a, a partial signal here, a symbol here. Uh, here we just fill in the uh, sigma. So this is just filling in. And here we use the sum rule to get rid of these sums to take the derivative inside the sum. So we're looking for the value of this over wi and this over wi. Those two together will give us our partial derivatives, which will give us, and all partial derivatives will give us our gradient. So we're going to start here and end up down here. Uh, so this, uh, incidentally, this is just one of these, right? We're going to start with this one and derive this one and then assume that we can do the other one as well. So we're going to just See if we can uh, we can derive this gradient here. So we start by filling in the sigmoid function, which is one over one plus x. This is starting to look quite hairy and quite intimidating. But one of the things I want to show you is that this sigmoid function has really nice behavior. That even though the derivative gets very complicated halfway through the derivation, at the end it ends up being very simple. It tends to cancel itself out and uh, eat itself during uh, during derivation of the gradient. So you end up with a very simple gradient if you use this logistic uh, sigmoid. So we fill this in. Uh, the uh, minus one of the logarithm is the same as taking the power, taking this to the power of minus one. Powers we can use take outside the logarithm, so that ends up here. So we end up with the logarithm of this over wi. 
Um, what are we doing here? Which rule? Any guesses? Chain rule? I heard you. Very good. So this is a function. This is two functions composed. This one, the logarithm, and this one. So we take the derivative of the logarithm with respect to its argument and then the derivative of this with respect to w, wi. Uh, the logarithm with respect to its argument works out this way. Uh, we're not using the natural logarithm, but the binary logarithm, so we get a little constant multiplier. Uh, you can get rid of this by scaling up your loss function. So for now, we'll just pretend this doesn't exist. You can get rid of that by slightly tweaking your loss function in a way that doesn't matter, that doesn't affect the optimum. So we end up with this times this. The, w the, the 1 plus falls out because it's constant with respect to wi. Uh, we use the chain rule again. This stays the same. We've deleted this one with a little hand waving. So we take the derivative of the exponent with respect to its argument and then the derivative of the argument with respect to wi. Uh, it's the derivative of the exponent. It's the most probably the most famous derivative. Uh, is itself. If you take the derivative of the exponent, you just get the exponent again. So here we just get this out and we move it to the top of this division. And on this side, remember, this part, well, the b falls out. b is constant with respect to wi. But this part is a um, dot product. So you write that down like... wi, xi over all w's, uh, dimensions of uh, x and w. Uh, so this is a big sum, which and all the um, terms of this sum are constant with respect to wi, except one, which is the one that contains xi. So this turns into just xi. And this, if you remember, from the previous slide is another way of defining the sigmoid rule. Uh, so that end up ends up like this. So here we have the sigmoid rule. This turns back into the sigmoid again, times wxi. And this is basically our classifier. This is basically what we started out with. So in the final step, we can fill that back in. And after all of this, what we end up with is just the negative of our classifier. Uh, for a negative example, the probability that um, our classifier assigns to the class negative for x times xi, where xi is just one, one dimension of the vector x. So don't worry too much if you didn't follow all of this, all of that, but just realize that uh, because we use this sigmoid rule, this whole thing, this whole complicated thing, collapses back down into a very simple gradient. And if we do it for the other one again, uh, so this was uh, this one and this was this one, then what we end up with as a loss function, as a gradient for the loss function, is something that says if you want to maximize the loss, so the loss function, the gradient of the loss function points in the direction of maximum loss, so the direction of the worst model, the worst you can uh, make your model. And we follow the opposite direction in gradient descent. So if you want to find the direction that makes your model as bad as possible, what you should do is take wi and add uh, can I actually summarize this? For every point, every positive point, you add the probability to wi that the classifier thought it was negative times the magnitude of xi, and you do the opposite for the other side. And that's how you make your classifier worst, worse, as bad as possible. Um, so if you go into the direction of the negative gradient, if the neg into the negative direction of the gradient, you do the opposite of this. So that's basically what the loss function for log uh, what the uh, Cross entropy loss function applied to the logistic regression gives us. Uh, just to explain 
briefly what that means and how it relates to linear least squares. In least squares, remember we have these residuals, right? And you can think of these as little rubber bands that are all pulling on the uh, on our function. And they're rubber bands because we have, uh, we take in our loss function the square of this value, the length of this rubber band. So the if I pull the rubber band twice as much, it pulls back uh, four times as much because it's a square. So the further I pull it out, uh, it gets e it starts pulling even stronger, which means that this point exerts, which is very far from the decision boundary, exerts much more influence on my surface than these points, which are very close to the decision boundary. And if you're lucky, they cancel out with points on this side, but that might not always be the case. And what logistic regression does is it gives you, it looks at these kinds of uh, residuals and it takes the logarithm of those residuals as your loss function. It sums those residuals. So the points very close to the decision boundary have the biggest influence and the points very far have almost no influence at all. So it does the exact opposite. Um, I did try it on the example from last week so here's the least squared decision surface. Here's the logistic regression decision surface. Um, unfortunately, for this data set, it doesn't make much of a difference. So you see the surface is a little bit more spread out and uh, the slope is a little bit more gradual. Uh, but the solution they eventually come up with is the same for this data set. So if you want to see where they differ, you need a different data set like this, like I showed you earlier. And what you see here, is that the points are roughly on a line. And if you want all the points to the, uh, so if you look at it on this line, and if you look at all the points, then roughly the decision surface, the, uh, the decision boundary, is just perpendicular to that line. And that's what least squares gives you. It basically draws a line like this through your data and it picks the decision boundary perpendicular to that. And what, uh, logistic regression does, it looks disproportionately at the points near the decision boundary. So it actually gives you a decision boundary that looks only at these points, which depends on your data whether or not that's a good thing. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. But that's what logistic regression gives you. That's all I had for today. Uh, we'll discuss this in the homework more, and please ask any questions on Canvas.